Hey folks, it's just Dom here with you today. Today we're going to actually answer a couple of questions that folks have asked me specifically about borderline personality disorder. And we're going to be talking about the potentiality that one particular person may be suffering from borderline personality disorder. Now, of course, I can't and I'm not interested in trying to make any kind of a diagnosis. I can't do that. It's not ethical to do that. It's not possible to do that. But to answer your question and shed some light on this and to help folks understand what could be going on in, as Dr. Todd Grande, one of my favorite psychology content creators and true crime content creators, in fact, says, what could, it's helpful to understand what could be going on in a situation like this with somebody who behaved similarly. This is just an example, and this is just a question that was asked. And so I'm going to try to address it directly, respectfully, and still kind of skate around actually diagnosing somebody with a disorder. I'm not some sort of a celebrity doctor who is comfortable talking out of the side of my mouth about celebrities I've never met or content creators I've never spoken with, or even ones I have met for that matter, and diagnosing them from afar. That's unethical, it's inappropriate. So we're not going to do that, but this is going to skate along a very fine line. So please bear with me on it. If you don't feel comfortable, don't listen. And I do want to let everyone know you're not to send any hate to the people that we're going to mention. This is a question that's been asked, and I'm going to try to answer it, but I don't want anybody targeting, lacking onto, or sending this person hate. In fact, I'd really prefer it if you didn't even bo bother to click on any of her videos, because unfortunately, that is just any of the links that lead to this person's content are just going to feed into some really apparently in my opinion, quite toxic behavior and some really toxic situations and some really harmful situations that I don't think benefit anybody. So please, while I'm not opposed to anybody clicking on content that discusses this person, that isn't directly from this person, that won't benefit them if you click on it, while I'm happy to have you click on commentary about this person or discussions about this person, please, again, don't click on anything that's going to go directly to them because they will get paid for it. They will get feedback from it. And it's just going to help their platform to continue. And to me, again, it appears, my opinion, that this person is in an unhealthy situation and perpetuating an unhealthy relationship with those who characteristically watch her content and interact with her. So I would appreciate it for everyone's well-being and everyone's wellness if you would please not click on their videos, if you would please definitely don't send them any hate, if you would please not interact with them at all. You can do your own research. You can go on Reddit where there's a whole subreddit dedicated to this person where you're not going to have to click on her links in order to find out more about her. So that being said, the person we're going to be discussing is the owner of the channel without a crystal ball. I don't know legally how far I want to go as far as naming people. Suffice it to say that I might call this person KJ. It seems like other content creators have had success with that. KJ the owner of the YouTube channel without a crystal ball, I believe, maybe somebody who might really embody the characteristics of someone with borderline personality disorder. Now, I, again, can't diagnose her and that's not my intent. However, you guys have asked what I think could be going on there. And in a situation like this with somebody who seems to behave the way, the way that she appears to behave, it wouldn't be unlikely or out of the realm of likelihood or possibility that somebody who does behave that way might be struggling 
from a cluster B disorder. And my guess, without diagnosing, I don't have all the information there, and this is just my own layman's opinion at this point, is that that uh, disorder might be something along the lines of BPD. I would say narcissism in many similar cases, but I don't think that narcissism is what's going on there. And since you guys have been interested in hearing a bit more about my opinion on the matter, because if you recall, while I was doing research for the Mika Stouffer video and podcast episode that I did, I did mention Without a Crystal Ball as being one of the content creators I turned to for information. Well, I think there was some good information there, but I think that I was mistaken in giving this person more hits, more clicks, and more credit than perhaps was due her. And at this point, because of her own actions, I definitely don't feel comfortable being a part of this apparent train wreck. So in the meanwhile, not only has this person been accused of stalking and harassing and has been involved in several lawsuits, one in particular involving the juggernaut mega initial YouTube creator when the platform first launched, Tati Westbrook. But this person has gotten into a lot of hot water with other content creators and other public personalities. And the drama just never seems to stop. Now, KJ, or without a crystal ball, if we refer to her by the name of her YouTube channel is somebody who's a commentary YouTuber. She has referred to herself as a journalist and a researcher. She has done writing for the website Patheos, and she appears to have referred to herself as a near alcoholic. I'm not sure what the terminology was off the top of my head, but somebody who might be in danger of abusing substances, which to me lends itself to the assumption that she likely at that point felt that she was using substances and perhaps was over utilizing substances and had developed an unhealthy relationship with substances, apparently via her own words, including alcohol. Now, this is important. It's a big characteristic of cluster B disordered individuals. And it's definitely very present in borderline personality disorder. Borderline personality disorder is characterized by unstable relationships, by a really toxic behavior that shows itself as a symptom called splitting. Splitting essentially looks something like this. The people in your life, if you're suffering from BPD, are never just people, shades of gray. They're either great or terrible. They're either the perfect girlfriend, the perfect boyfriend, or the absolute worst. They're the perfect mom, dad, or parent, or the absolute worst. There's never any gray area. The people around you are either the best or the worst at any given time. Annie apparently agrees because she's meowing. Very strong agreement there. Yes, Annie cat. And there's no sort of distinguishing between what these people who are suffering from this disorder are thinking and feeling inside themselves and what other people are doing and how other people are behaving and what other people might be going through. Because it's never about those other people. It's never about the girlfriend, the wife, the husband, the parent, the child. It's never about them. Whether or not they're being split, whether or not they are being treated as the golden child or the black sheep on any given day, whether or not they're being treated like the best mom ever, the worst dad ever on any given day, is totally up 
to the person with BPD. It has nothing to do with the behavior of those around them. And it has everything to do with the behavior of the person suffering from the personality disorder. Now, these people have a very unstable locus of control. They tend toward seeing life, if you will, as a series of events that happens to them and not something that they contribute to via their own behavior, via their own actions, their own thoughts. They seem to have almost a victim complex, as if everything happening to them is happening to them because they're a martyr or a victim. Well, that's a very difficult situation to deal with. Speaking from experience, I've known people close to me who have had BPD. And yes, BPD is the one and only cluster B personality disorder that's treatable and can be cured. So it's not all doom and gloom if BPD is happening. And that's one reason I felt a little bit less uncomfortable answering this question from a listener because it's not a diagnosis like narcissism or psychopathy, you know, antisocial personality disorder, for instance, that is all doom and gloom and all kind of, well, either you have it or you don't, you don't get over it. No, this is a very different proposition. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing for our purposes, especially in discussing this particular person. So these people struggle with feelings of isolation, boredom. They use substances to cope. Many times they are actual addicts. And we realize, of course, that addiction is a physical illness, not just a, a, a mental illness, right? Addiction's a physical illness, and it has many genetic components that are very important to discuss and to keep in mind when talking about that topic. Now, BPD does lend itself to addiction. Many people with BPD do end up having struggles with substance abuse, with substance misuse, and simply, even if they're not full-blown addicts, they tend to have poor self-control, poor self-regulation, and poor relationships to substances and to other people. They, of course, because of all of this, do struggle to feel empathy for others, although they are capable of it, unlike other cluster B disordered individuals. So having that unstable, mutable sense of self gives you a really distorted sense of reality and of who you are as a person if you're suffering from this. That's why I called the podcast episode where we discussed this topic, borderline personality disorder, twisted lens, because it's like looking in a funhouse mirror. It's like looking through a fisheye lens. You're seeing shared reality as well as your personal reality in a distorted way. And that, of course, influence and affects your relationships and your interactions with everyone around you. So as I mentioned, that does tend to cause issues with substance misuse and abuse, potential for addiction, struggling to feel empathy, and, of course... It leads to splitting, so idealization, love bombing, and then hatred, maybe even abuse of the people in your life if you're the one struggling with this disorder. So try to look at it, try to be empathetic and look at it from the standpoint of somebody who's suffering from this potential disorder, right? Think about what that might be like. You're going to have a lot of depressive, angry feelings, perhaps some anxiety thrown in. And these people do, unfortunately, 
tend to engage in self-isolation. Again, love bombing too to that other extreme with, with people around them. They can be very hostile. They can have almost emotional breaks where they become very irate. They do tend to feel like everyone's gonna leave them, disappoint them, or betray them. Betray is a word I hear a lot from the people I've known in my life who have had BPD, including clients and people whom I've known personally, as I mentioned. So they feel a very strong sense of betrayal if what somebody else, not even just says or does, but appears to say or do to them in their mind, if you uh, do or say something that even appears to them, even because of nothing having to do with your own actions, but everything having to do with where they're at emotionally, if you even appear to be leaving them, betraying them, they may have a an emotional break and end up being extremely hostile. Nobody deserves that. It's important to understand what factors lead to this without excusing the behavior itself because it's not acceptable. Now, I mentioned that there is definitely an unstable sense of self, right? That twisted lens. Well, unfortunately, you're gonna notice that people who suffer from BPD are unable to hold a career for a long time. And if they do, it may be that there's nepotism involved. It may be that it's a career where they get to get away with a lot. Maybe the boss isn't cracking down on them. Maybe they are the boss. Maybe they get to work alone most of the time. But in most careers, people with BPD, unchecked and untreated, are not going to be successful. In fact, they'll either quit in rage or they will be fired. They do burn bridges. Their relationships are very unstable and unsteady. And while you may be love bombed initially upon first meeting and interacting with somebody with BPD, you will eventually turn into the enemy. You don't have to even do anything wrong. You don't have to say anything wrong. They will split you and their view about who you are and why is gonna flip. You'll end up being the enemy. So don't be too flattered by the love bombing to understand that you will be the enemy eventually. Just like with a narcissist. Now you can see where there's overlap there. Obviously it's a very clear comparison. One of the differences, one of the things that really sets borderline personality disordered folks apart from other cluster B disorders is that not only do they engage in risky drug and substance use and sexual behavior and risky friendship behavior and even work behavior and family behavior and just interactions with people, but they are very self-destructive and not just in that sort of self sabotage way that narcissists are self self-destructive, but they will actually often cut themselves, harm themselves, attempt suicide, look like they're attempting suicide. Now, oftentimes it's not just a show, like they're actually attempting it, right? But they're capable of doing both and it's never good to just assume it's a show. What you can assume if you're getting signs or, or signals that this is somebody who may be looking to talk about self-harm, what you can assume is that they really are in distress and that they really are going to harm themselves whether or not they actually succeed in committing suicide. It's really important not to mince words about that. I know that's a very, very upsetting topic. I've lost people to suicide and I understand what a, a, a loaded topic that is, and it's very important to discuss. Certainly not everyone who commits suicide or who dies of a mental illness had BPD. That's, that's not what I'm trying to say. But many people with BPD will attempt suicide at least once. So here's that difference between narcissism, for instance, between antisocial personality disorder and BPD. 
they actively self-harm and it's not just self-sabotage. They hurt and kill themselves and they unfortunately tend to cause other people harm. Now, they're not as out and out physically dangerous as, say, somebody with antisocial personality disorder or narcissism might be to someone else around them. But that doesn't mean that they can't cause a lot of emotional upheaval, right? So 80% of people with BPD, that's right, guys, 80% do display suicidal behaviors and self-harm. Now, there are some really great means of treatment, and apparently, from what I understand from clinicians who work specifically with cluster B folks and with folks with BPD, apparently, the popularity and the factuality of the idea that BPD can actually be fully cured is something that's gaining a lot of ground. And I've looked at some of the data and it does seem to be very promising. So there's definitely hope for those who may struggle with BPD. But if you're just the loved one, friend, family member, or coworker of someone with BPD, I want to caution you, you can't make them get help. And getting help once is not going to cure everything out and out on its own. Oftentimes, people don't even want to acknowledge the diagnosis. And if they do, they're going to slip. They're going to fall just like an addict. They're going to relapse into their behavior. So it's best to be able to be there for them from afar if you can. Because up close, you may really get hurt yourself, you may end up with something like CPTSD. You don't need that. So find those boundaries and stick to them. And people with BPD will push. They don't mean to, but they do. It, it's part of who they are. Again, because personality disorders are not mental illness. They're disorders of the personality. Can't be a lot clearer than that. So what you can do if you have BPD and what you can encourage those around you who you might be close to who may be struggling with BPD to do, but you can't force them to do, of course, is to undergo cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, or dialectical behavioral therapy. So DBT and CBT are great options for people with borderline personality disorder. They're great options for a lot of mental illnesses and personality disorders, and even EMDR can be very helpful. Eye, eye movement desensitization, it, it can be very helpful for any traumatic root trauma caused, put it that way, personality disorder or mental illness. So now that we've discussed what BPD is, Let's try to answer some of your questions about KJ or without a crystal ball. Now, without diagnosing, I can say that this person does appear to, in my opinion, present with certain affectations that appear to mimic the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. Now, again, this person's been involved in lawsuits. They've apparently, my opinion based on the research I've done, got to qualify that. They've apparently been caught in lies. They've been caught stalking people that they claim to be doing commentary videos about. They've been caught playing victim and saying that they're being targeted because people like Toddy Westbrook, for instance, have turned around and said, no, enough. You don't need to look for copies of my birth certificate. You don't need to spread what I believe are lies about me or my loved ones, my husband, my company. We're not going to get into all of the apparent lies that, that KJ has told, right? That's not the purpose of this episode. 
we're just here to look at whether or not KJ's behavior might be in line with the diagnostic criteria of borderline personality disorder. So lying, harassment, stalking, uh, no boundaries, not respecting people's wishes, not respecting people's privacy, crying foul anytime anybody calls them out on their inappropriate behavior, the potential use of substances while on air, the amount of live streams and videos that are released on a daily basis that seem, in my opinion, to obsessively cover topics that this individual appears interested in, which include reality TV, which include, I guess, the Stouffer's. I mean, to me, people like the Stouffer's are worth one commentary episode, and that's it. They are not worth anybody's time to obsess over, my opinion. But this and, and all of the stuff with Toddy Westbrook and all of the just incidences that this individual KJ has had with other content creators, all the beefs she's had apparently with other channels and other creators. Uh, apparently there was a larger channel called Creep Show Art whom KJ at the time being a smaller channel with without a crystal ball on YouTube uh, had approached about collaborating because sometimes creep show art would try to collaborate with smaller creators. Well, when creep show art just kind of didn't respond, KJ intensified and in her attempts to work with creep show art and the woman who runs the channel became what the content creator behind creep show art appears to describe as well kind of incessant and inappropriate. And then they go from it's almost like the character of Stan in the Eminem music video for the song Stan. It's like they go from dear Marshall, you know, to you horrible person. I'm going to come over there and, you know, and without any input from creep show art, right? It's just like the Stan video without any input from the subject of interest. You go from idolization to complete devaluation. And that is absolutely a hallmark of borderline personality disorder. The situation with Tati Westbrook appears very indicative of the potential for KJ's behavior lining up very equally with the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. One of the heinous things that KJ has done, and this is just one of many, in my opinion, based on the research I've done, is that she insinuated that Ms. Westbrook's husband, shortly after losing his mom, by the way, which is bad enough, that she insinuated that he killed his mom after making her sign over money and sign over a mortgage or something to him. And that ended up not being true at all. And to, to go ahead and say something like that about someone publicly is obviously inappropriate. And a normal person, if they said something that was inappropriate or that somebody felt hurt or targeted by, would apologize, whether or not they felt that they were wrong, right? They would actually go, you know what, I can see why you were upset about that. That, Yeah, I apologize for that. I, I shouldn't have said that. And they would learn from that and then not do that again. So these sorts of behaviors, having beefs with different content creators, having beefs with people who haven't ever even answered her messages, having these imagined periods of, of apparent victimhood, and then crying foul and, and acting like the victim, and then even going so far as to apparently go on live streams and talk about harming herself and potentially committing suicide, that 
that behavior appears to be in line with the diagnostic criteria for borderline personality disorder. And I can certainly compare and contrast what I'm personally noticing with behavior with regard to the parameters set up for diagnosis of borderline personality disorder without actually diagnosing her. And that's the line that I'm walking to hopefully answer your questions about this. I've been hesitant about putting this video out or this podcast episode out for a while because I haven't wanted to add to any stress or negativity, but I also think it's important to discuss other people's potential perspectives and to understand those perspectives. Oftentimes, listeners will confuse understanding and empathizing with someone's likely perspective with excusing them from all blame. I need you to understand that that's not what I'm attempting to do. I'm not trying to excuse KJ without a crystal ball of their behavior because their behavior is, in my opinion, is absolutely abhorrent and borders on stalking and is abusive and manipulative and speaks to the likelihood that she is not well. And that's why I don't want people clicking on those links. I don't want people hating on her or sending her negative comments or negative stuff or hate. I I want people to just go, oh, now I understand why all of these commentary channels have been talking about her. Now I understand why maybe I shouldn't play into this situation. And now I understand where she might be coming from or where somebody who I perhaps know who's acting like she acts might be coming from. So I guess I want to help teach people a lesson in empathy. That's my goal for this episode. And I hope I've done that. Let's run through the diagnostic criteria one more time on medscape.com and see if any of the things you know to be true about KJ without a crystal ball and some of the things that I've discussed with you today feel like they match up with any of these diagnostic criteria. I'll leave that up to you. What do you personally think? Please don't attempt to diagnose anybody, but it might behoove you to do some thinking and to learn about this. And it's, if nothing else, a good exercise in empathy and critical thought and the consideration of why not all content creators need to be clicked on. I I don't click on people like Trisha Paytas. I don't click on people like Shane Dawson anymore. I don't click on people like without a crystal ball because I believe that these are people, uh, Eugenia Cooney comes to mind. I believe that these are people who are experiencing potential mental health breakdowns or personality breakdowns. And I don't think that it's healthy to play into that or to give that person any kind of feedback they can use, whether it end up being narcissistic supply, whether it end up being ED supply, whether it end up being something like borderline supply. I don't want to play into that. And I'm not going to discuss the situation endlessly like some people are doing. Nothing against them. If that's what they do, you're a commentary channel. You do you. I don't think it warrants discussing more than once. So this is my stab at that. So again, we're going to go through these couple of diagnostic criteria before I let you guys go and... Let me know what you think in the comments section. Uh, Again, avoiding diagnosis, being respectful, kind, and thoughtful, and not sending hate to anybody mentioned here or anyone else for that matter. So some of the signs and symptoms via Medscape.com are disturbances in experiencing oneself as unique. So... That, what does that mean in layman's terms? That means that the boundaries of who you are and who everyone else is are bleeding together. Poor boundaries, like I said, between self and others. Poor emotional regulation. 
an inability to soothe self adequately, resulting in excess emotional reactions to stresses and frustrations, maladaptive attempts at self-soothing, suicide threats, self-harm, and angry behavior, an unstable sense of self with poor ability for self-direction, and impaired ability to pursue meaningful short-term goals with satisfaction. Marked instability in functioning, affect, mood, interpersonal relationships, and at times, even reality testing. Disturbances in empathy, disturbances in intimacy, a pattern of impulsivity, risk-taking, and poor self-image. So I'm going to ask you guys again, what do you think? Do you think that any of these signs and symptoms might be reflected in this person's behavior? Again, while kindly and thoughtfully withholding from any actual judgment or diagnoses. Frantic efforts, again, to avoid real or imagined abandonment. This does not include suicidal or self-mutilating behavior covered in Criterion 5. A pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships characterized by alternating extremes of idealization and devaluation. Again, as I mentioned, that that is called splitting. That is the hallmark that sets BPD apart from narcissism. That and the ability to empathize, even if they don't have a lot of practice with empathy. Marked and persistent uh, persist, excuse me, if I could speak, marked and persistent, unstable self-image or sense of self, impulsivity at, in at least two areas that are potentially self-damaging, like spending, sex, substance abuse, reckless driving, binge eating. This doesn't include suicidal or self-mutilating behavior covered in Criterion 5. Recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures, or threats, or self-mutilating behavior. Effective instability due to a marked reactivity of mood, e.g. the intense episodic dysphoria. Irritability or anxiety, usually lasting a few hours and only rarely more than a few days. Chronic feelings of emptiness inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, e.g. frequent outbursts and displays of temper, constant anger, recurring physical fights, recurring emotional fights, transient stress-related paranoid ideation or severe dissociative symptoms. So these are the diagnostic criteria and I hope that understanding them and being able to thoughtfully and critically think about their application, not just potentially in KJ's case, but in life in general, I hope that that might help you to find some empathy for people who struggle with these issues. And again, empathy doesn't mean excusing their behavior. Empathy doesn't mean, oh, it's okay because it's been explained. What it means is, okay, now I understand why it's happening and I'm not going to put up with it anymore. And now I know exactly how to hone my skills so I don't have to put up with it and how to set my boundaries so that they work, right? So that is the reason we discuss things like that. And that's the reason that I'm answering this question despite it being kind of awkward and kind of difficult to answer. And despite it maybe having been an easier course of action for me to just ignore the subject completely and not address it and not put myself out there. Well, you guys know that's not me. So I decided I'm going to give it my best shot. This was it. I hope I've answered your question. And I genuinely wish KJ the very best. I do hope that she does take her channel off of YouTube. I think she would do well to get off of social media entirely, at least 
until she gets whatever help she needs for whatever she's going through. And I hope that she doesn't cause anyone else harm while she continues to apparently live out and relive and re relive and react to and, and get caught up in that cycle of just constantly reliving her own trauma and, and reacting to her own trauma because it appears that that may be where she's at. You know, the old saying, hurt people, hurt people. Well, she seems to be a hurt person and it appears that she is hurting other people. So I do hope that she will end her relationship with YouTube apologize for the things that she has done that have hurt others because folks let's be honest intent doesn't matter if it was received in a negative way intent doesn't matter if it was received in a way that felt harmful Now that is, of course, taking into the account, into account the fact that we're kind of giving everybody an honor system approach, that we're not weaponizing our victimhood, and that we're not saying that we feel victimized, attacked, violated when we don't, right? So let's hold space for the fact that now and again there are going to be people who are bad faith actors and maybe who don't actually feel victimized but who want you to think they do and that's something that does go hand in hand with folks who struggle with untreated BPD okay but for those who are being honest and we're giving everyone the benefit of the doubt here that everyone's acting in good faith for those who are acting in good faith, if you genuinely were hurt by something that someone said or did, it doesn't matter what they meant by it, it just matters how it was received. And if you find yourself often offended or hurt, I would like for you to look at that. I would like for you to look at that and say, am I playing into this? Was this something that was genuinely meant to be hurtful? Because to always be in the position of being the victim or to feel like a martyr, something's not right. But to genuinely now again be now and again be hurt by something somebody says or does, well that's normal and it's really incumbent upon in a situation like that, the person doing or saying the thing that was hurtful to you to be the grown up and to apologize and to own up to their actions and, and to try to understand your perspective. And of course, conversely, it's important for you to try to understand their perspective, which brings us back around to why we're here right now. So I hope that this episode has helped you to do that. And if you have any other questions, feel free to ask. Thanks so much for listening.